get to kick off a new series called Love Like That. Can you say Love Like That? Love Like That. Yeah, we're going to kick that off. Also, this is important, it's Pumpkin Spice Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> How many enjoyed a uh, pumpkin spice donut and some coffee? Yeah? Yeah, it's pretty good stuff. Um, I, I enjoy a good cup of coffee and a donut, but you know, I didn't start drinking coffee until later in life. And in fact, one of the funny moments was I had coffee and somehow I got a donut and I was eating them together and I was thinking, man, this is awesome. <laughs> What a tremendous co- uh, 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 a combination, you know. And I remember telling Sherry, you ought to try coffee and a donut. Like it was this, this revelation, you know, type of thing. And I remember her looking at me like I had things crawling out of my ears. No joke, like, duh, everybody knows that, you know, kind of a thing. But I think, you know, when I think about coffee, the thing that I like most about it is the conversations that happen around coffee. I mean, we live in a coffee culture here in the Pacific Northwest, definitely so, and um, we talk about a lot of different things when we're around coffee. Um, Favorite uh, movies, maybe, or our kids. Uh, Could be we're talking about sports and and politics, although that can get a little bit hot and heavy these days. Um, School, maybe even the weather or whatever it is. We talk about this stuff, but eventually... I think we get to conversations that are even more important, right? Um, Such as relationships. It always seems to get down to eventually when we get very deep, it gets to relationships. And and I think it's because relationships cause pain and relationships bring joy. There's a little bit of everything with them. The reality is that relationships bring a lot of emotion. How many have found that to be true? Yeah, there's a lot of emotion. There's the joy, and there's the pain, and there's the happiness, and there's the sadness, and all of that. And, and it's because we, we love people, right? And we love some people a whole, whole lot. You know, our family, our, our closest friends, you know, they, we love them. And so what happens in these relationships create emotion. And, and sometimes even loving relationships can be hard. Raise your hand if you would agree with me that sometimes loving relationships can be hard. Yeah, I'm not alone. Because, and here's why, the world is full of difficult people. (laughs) Of course, it's never us, right? It's never us. And uh, the fact is, it's, it's entirely possible that me even bringing it up brings a difficult person uh, to your mind. So you're like sitting here right now and saying, oh yeah, right? That, that person, I think most everybody knows what I'm talking about, that, that person that makes it, well, they make it hard to love them. <laughs> they make it hard to love them, or that it's that super awkward person, you know, type of thing. And, and maybe, just maybe, if you don't know that person, it might be you. <laughs> you, you might be the person, okay? Um, so, so what do we do? What do we do in these situations? What do we do with these people? What do we do with those relationships that are, are constantly difficult or maybe even worse, even strained? Um, I, I think our natural tendency is to um, run the other way. I think, you know, we kind of, you know, you see them coming, and so you're like, you go another way, you're right, right? Or, or at least you try to limit your exposure or your time with people that are difficult, or it's strained, or whatever. But I think we need to ask, is that the best course? Is that the best course? I mean, is that a God course um, that we should follow? So how can we love people more fully? That's a big question we want to answer in this series. How can we love people more fully? Over the next six weeks, and again, I want to challenge you to be here, Uh, We'll be observing the life of Jesus. We're going to look deep into his life because um, as we uh, imitate his life, we begin to love more fully. Okay, we begin to love more fully. I I think every person should want to love more like Jesus. Whether you are an atheist or an agnostic or wherever you are in your faith, uh, I I think you'll find that Jesus is, is compelling, a compelling example of how a person should really love. 
Regardless of what you think about him, is he the son of God, all that kind of stuff. He is like the most compelling example of how to love. And besides, who wouldn't want to improve their relationships? Amen? I want to improve my relationships. Who wants to improve their marriage? Like three of you? <laughs> Let me say, no, I checked out a long time ago. That isn't good. <laughs> that isn't good. So as we begin this series, you need to understand that, that we are all trying to figure this out. I, I don't have it all figured out. You don't have it all figured out. We're trying to figure it out. We're, we're hoping to become better, right? Better at loving other people. We're trying to get it right. We're trying to get it right. And, and I think that's because we're created in the image of God. We're created in the image of God. We're, we're created to love because God is love. So let's look at what God teaches about love. How many think that would be a good idea? Let's do that. Now, we find that love is the overwhelming theme of the Holy Scriptures. It's the whole overwhelming theme of the Bible. God's great love for humanity. Man having followed the redemption process, salvation, his love for us. Throughout the entire Bible, particularly, obviously, the New Testament, it's all about God's love for humanity. And of course, it's the theme uh, in the secular sphere as well, isn't it? I mean, it's the theme in movies. It's, it's uh, many times the theme of books and, and certainly, I hope, wedding ceremonies, uh, Beatles songs. I grew up listening to Beatles songs. So many of them are about love, you know, type, love, love me do. How many have ever heard that one? Uh, country music, right? Poetry. All this stuff is fueled by love. And, and I'm reading a book right now that really God has used to inspire this series, and it's called Love Like That, by Dr. Les Parrott. How many have ever heard of Dr. Les Parrott? He's involved in, you know, relationships and does just a great job. And this book is, it really challenges us, I think, to move from inspirational um, aspects of love, the inspirational part of it, to practical acts, uh, aspects of, of love. And so we're starting this series Love like that to help us love like Jesus. Help us to love like Jesus. Um, the theme passage for our series is found in the book of Ephesians. So if you have your, your Bible, um, whether you're looking on it on your phone or you have a copy just like this, uh, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5 here in just a moment. And, and Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus um, begins with some great foundational principles of Christianity. Uh, the, you know, one of them is the principles, of, a principle of adoption, that God wants to adopt us into his family. He wants us to be his children. Uh, the blessings of God, he gets into that here. The, the nature of God's amazing grace, that he loves us even though we don't deserve it. Uh, the ultimate purposes of God, the great questions of life are all found here some heavy theology, some really important stuff. And in it is where we hit here today, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And these are our, this is going to be our foundational verse or the theme of our series, if you will. So, so listen on purpose. Here we go. It says, imitate God, therefore. In everything you do, let me put it in its context. Paul has just been talking to them about living as children of God, living as children of light. And he goes through a bunch of, uh, of important stuff. And then he gets to verse 5. And he says, therefore, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He has loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. I want to build on that a little bit by reading a paraphrased version that maybe will help bring some more clarity to it for you. Maybe the light bulbs will come on even a little bit more. And, and it's the message version. It says this, watch what God does. So in, be imitators of God. This one says, watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. He loved, he, his love was not cautious but extravagant. 
He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Love like that. The whole of Christian life is summed up by Jesus to love God and love others. To love God and love others. That's what Jesus lived out. Okay? And, and in our series, we'll learn more about the how. How to love like Jesus. Speaking of how, so, so how do we begin, right? How do we begin? Well, I love how Paul uh, uh, approaches this subject of, of how to love. It's, it's quite straightforward, if you didn't catch it. It's quite straightforward. And it starts out with this. If you want to love like Jesus... Imitate God. Imitate God. Watch what God does and then do it. Right? It's kind of like, how many, as, as a child, you played the game follow the leader? Right? Whatever the leader does, you do, or you're out type of thing. I'm too thankful God doesn't kick us out. But you know what I'm saying? Follow the leader, or Simon says, or whatever it is. You're following that person. So it's so simple when in this context. It's so simple, yet... It's so profound. So how do we begin to love like Jesus? Uh, It's basically by watching Jesus, by observing Jesus, by looking intently into the life of Jesus Christ. That's how. Uh, But here's the problem. Here's the problem oftentimes. Uh, We aren't great observers. We're usually focused on ourselves. And the reality is that our culture frowns at watching others too closely for various reasons. Some good ones, but for various reasons. You know, when, you know in fact, we even call that creepy when somebody does that. Hey, that person keeps staring at me. They're, they must be a creeper, right? I mean, haven't you ever heard stuff like that? The interesting thing is, though, if you travel around the world, you'll quickly discover that other cultures don't have that same perspective and that same, same hang-up. In fact, their personal space, where ours is usually, you know, like, well, I'm real comfortable when you're back there. You know, theirs is closer, doesn't bother them. And I find it interesting that when we read many of the accounts of Jesus in the New Testament... We find Jesus staring intently, intently into a person's heart and soul before he does something remarkable in that person's life or the lives of those around that person. We read read one such example in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 42. Listen, if you would. It says, then Andrew uh, brought Simon to meet Jesus. Now watch this. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter, Petros, meaning a stone. We could go into that whole name thing. But what I want you to notice here this morning is the phrase, Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said. You see, to look in. To look at something in, with intentionality or intently means to look beyond the surface. So he, he looks beyond the surface of Simon, who becomes Peter. He looks deeper into his life. It, it really means to look beyond the present, what you see in the present, to look into future possibilities from what is to what could be or should be. For us to really grasp how to, to, to love like Jesus, we need to really look intently beyond the surface at the life of Jesus Christ and then imitate it. Imitate it, obviously with God's help. We can't do it in our own strength or anything like that. The word for imitators is the Greek word, which means to mimic. I think we all know what it means to mimic, right? To mimic something. That word is found in the first part of Ephesians chapter 5, imitate God. It means to mimic, and it can be translated also, interestingly, follow. To follow God. 
follow God or watch and then do. And really, that should be the goal of every single Christian uh, within every context of your life, whether it's your marriage relationship or with your neighbor or at work or whatever it is, uh, the goal of every Christian in every circumstances without pulling some out should be to follow Jesus. What would he do in that situation? That's why sometimes Christians are called Christ followers. Watch Jesus and do what he did. Our verse alludes to the example of parents and children. You'll see it alluded to there. One of the goals of parenthood is to have your kids um, behave the same way you behave. Um, So Paul uses the example, this example in Ephesians 5.1, for how to follow Jesus, right? Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents, as, as the message version extrapolates it. Some parents might be thinking, oh, you know, I'm not sure I want my children (laughs) to mimic my words and actions. Well, if that's you, we have some life groups for you, by the way, where you can make some adjustments and see some transformation in your life. Well, you'll want your children to actually watch what you do. But it reminds me of a story um, that I love to tell on Sherry, okay? Um, It's always more fun to tell on other people. I don't know if that's biblical, but it's a fun thing to do. Um, actually, I have permission. But um, when our kids were little, I-, I remember actually the day she got home and told me the story. When our kids were little, Sherry was driving, and she saw a police car up ahead suddenly. And all of a sudden, she realized there's a police officer pointing a radar gun, you know, right at her car. And dare I say it, Sherry said, oh, crap. Yeah, I know it's hard to believe. (laughs) But then she hears our our toddler, our sweet little toddler in the back say, oh, quap. (laughs) (laughs) And that day, Sherry had a realization. (laughs) She needed to make a change. And so every time she purposed to say when she saw a police car or a police officer, and she does it to this day, oh, look, kids, there's a police officer trying to keep us safe. Sometimes when she says that, I, I don't know. I think a different thing. <laughs> but Sherry had learned. You have to remember, Sherry's dad is a police officer all her life. Sherry had learned, and and she learned that our kids were what? Intentionally watching her, listening to her, right? And so she had to make some changes. She learned that she was an example to them. Well, Jesus leads us by example. Do you want to know what God's love's like? You look like you look at Jesus. And so we look to the life of Jesus and we imitate him with the help of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, with God's, God's help. That's what we do. How, how does that uh, imply that we can be, now, I, when we say imitate, does that imply we, should, we can be omnipresent everywhere like God? No, right? No, that's what we're talking about. Does it imply that we, we're, we're setting out to create the universe? No. I mean, that's something God does. The context is very specific of how we should imitate God. And some of you aren't going to like it. But you should love it. The context is, we should imitate God in forgiveness. I know. Oh, you just don't get it, Pastor, what this person does to me. But we don't get what we had done to God. Meaning we should forgive as God in Christ forgave us. You want to know how to love like Jesus? We should forgive as God in Christ forgave us. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, it says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. 
So one of the major building blocks of loving like Jesus is being a forgiving person. Goes on, we, we, when we're imitating God, we're imitating God's love, meaning we love another sacrificially. How many know sometimes it's a sacrifice to forgive that way? You know, forgive things. We, we, we live sacrifice just as Christ sacrificially loved us. In Ephesians 5.2, it says, live a life filled with love. Uh, following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. We want to imitate that, a pleasing aroma to God. God receives that in others. We find Paul similarly urging people uh, in, the, to the, in, the, in the city of Corinth, the church at Corinth, uh, to imitate him as he imitates God or Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Do you see it again? You see it again? And Paul was, it's interesting, if you look at the, at the context, Paul was sacrificially referring to how he was willing uh, to sacrifice his life. He's referring to how he sacrificed his life. He gives up his rights so that other people can see Jesus. So with your neighbor, you give up your rights so that other people can see Jesus. With people at church, you give up your rights so other people can see Jesus. With your kids, you give up your rights so that other people can see Jesus. With your spouse, you give up your rights so other people can see Jesus. This is how Paul followed the example of Christ and then invites others to follow his example. Other passages also speak of of being imitators of God or of Jesus, although they use different words. Let me look at, for example, 1 Peter uh, 1, starting with verse 14, it urges us not to act like we did uh, before we followed Christ or before we became a believer, but to be holy in our behavior as, as God is holy. What is that saying? We're to be imitating him, right? Meaning God has set us apart for himself, so we should behave like those who are consecrated to God's eternal purposes, not living for things that don't really matter. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus calls us to be perfect as our heavenly Father is. Now, that doesn't mean striving to be perfect for perfect sake. That means striving to be like Jesus because he's perfect. The context is God's example being imitators. Is that making, is that making sense? Matthew 5, 44, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting. You will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's what loving like Jesus does. Whether they're your enemy or whether they're your best friend, it doesn't matter. You just love them. But let's understand we're not talking about just imitate. We don't want to be cheap imitations of Jesus. Um, You know, like a knockoff type of thing. It's kind of like we're checking all the boxes. We're doing all the do's and don'ts. There's a lot of Christians that fall into that. Well, I did that, I did that, I did that. You know, it goes, goes, how many, I love crab. How many here love crab? Are there a few people that like crab? I don't like the imitation crab. I don't. I mean, it's fish. You know, it's just, it's an actual, you know. And it, for me, I mean, some of you might like it, I, but for me, it's just, it doesn't even come close, okay? I, I, what I want you to get is this is about following Jesus, cooperating with what God wants to work out in our hearts and lives. Are, are we all catching that? Being yielded to his spirit, letting the Holy Spirit work in and direct your life. It's very purposeful. It's very 
focus. It, it's as we walk in the spirit, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We fulfill the will of God. It goes deeper than merely um, imitating actions, you know, type of follow the leader in, in the childhood sense. It's more than, than actions. It's heart. Your heart has to be in it. If, if we recognize Jesus as our Lord and Savior, uh, he sends God's spirit to live in us. How many are thankful for that? It says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by his spirit if, if you have the spirit of God living in you and if you're cooperating, all right? The fruit of, the, of God's spirit, we talk about the fruit of the spirit. God's spirit in us means that God's own character, his own heart is at work within us. Because of this, we will grow more and more and more like him because of his own gift of his spirit to our lives. So how will we be able to imitate Jesus? We begin to observe Jesus, not just like, you know, just the action. We observe him personally. You know, it's one thing to know about somebody intellectually, like maybe through a book or some other means, but it's a whole other thing to relate to them personally. How many have found that to be true? Yeah? I mean, it, it, there's a big difference between hearing or learning about somebody from somebody else uh, than actually meeting them, spending time with them, interacting with them. So the key to observing and imitating Jesus is relationship. It's relationship with him. It's not just knowing about him. It's a relationship with him. A personal relationship with Christ is the starting point of all of this. Everything Jesus did was about establishing a relationship with us that we could know God. He wants you to know God. You know, whether you're trying to figure it out or maybe you're new to church or you're new to faith or you're just, you're just kind of here, or maybe you're a, you're a dedicated, seasoned Christ follower, all right? You could be at any place. You'll find out that God's love is expressed to you throughout the pages of the Bible, right? And that Jesus came to earth so that your sins could be forgiven. You could receive this awesome gift of eternal life, but that you would be personally connected with your creator. The Lord God is not distant. He's not indifferent. He's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. He desires a relationship. He wants you to know and experience personally his love. Jesus loves you and wants a relationship with you. I think I said it maybe 10, 13 different ways there. So let's learn how to observe and imitate Jesus more fully. How many of you think that's a good idea? We read in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 27, where Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. In this verse, we learn that God wants us to pursue him with what? Everything. Everything. So let's, let's observe him with everything. Let's observe him with it. God has blessed us with, with um, an ama you know, a, a amazing uh, combination of physical abilities and, and a brain. We all have a brain. Don't, you don't need to sing the old song, If Only I Had a Brain. We all have a brain to help us, what, think and plan and work and enjoy life. So God wants to bless, strengthen, renew guard our minds as we focus our thoughts and actions on him. The enemy is constantly trying to distract you to everything else but God. 
But it says here you should love him with all your mind uh, is referring to your thought life, your understanding, okay? We are to love God with all our mind. God is to be the central focus of our thoughts. I want you to think about your day. I want you to think about when you go to bed. I want you to think about when you get up. He is to be the central focus of our thoughts. Our thought life primarily should be on him. As human beings, we are blessed to have been given great minds by God. And he wants to bless and enable us to use them for our greatest potential for him. This can be achieved as we keep our minds focused on him. So as we focus on Jesus and align our minds with his word, he is the word, and, and, and his, his spirit then is, is, has the ability to transform our thinking, okay? Our minds are renewed. This is the best way, by the way. There's, there's other things that can be done for sure. This is the best way to deal with depression. Let's not have our minds in neutral. You know what neutral is, right? Not engaged. You can't go forward. You can't go backwards. You just kind of, right? You're not going anywhere. Let's, let's not feed, uh, feed our minds on the constant diet of the secular or a secular worldview or an ungodly worldview. Let's feed our mind with the truths of God's word. On Jesus, let's use our minds, our thoughts, our understanding to more fully love like Jesus. Let's make that the primary focus of our mind. Remember, love isn't merely a mo- an emotion. It, it has emotion components that we'll talk about, but it's not just that. But it, there is more. Let's, let's say, to fully love like Jesus, we must engage both our minds and our hearts. It's both and, isn't it? Both must be fully engaged if we're going to love like Jesus. We, we use our minds and we use our hearts to be imitators of God, to love the way Jesus loved. We use our minds and we use our hearts to love like that. And it's very intentional. To love like Jesus, we need to both Think and feel. To love like Jesus, we need to both reason and have emotion. To to love like Jesus, we need our heart and we need our head working together. It's the only way to bring perfect love into our imperfect lives. As we launch into this series will discover that Jesus is more than a model or an example to follow. Jesus is love. That's hard for us to get our heads around. Jesus is love. He is the source. And he offers to work in us, increasing our capacity to love others. When I say others, I want you to keep it personal. Because we have this tendency, oh yeah, that person. Haven't really met them yet. They might look like this. No, it's personal. And that can only begin as we acknowledge we are as we acknowledge our need for him, our desperate need for him. And accept that love that he offers us. He first loves us. That's a heart issue. That's not just a a brain function issue. That's a heart issue. When we make that decision to allow Jesus in, when we respond, his, you know, from from the heart uh, and our head, Jesus makes our hearts come alive. He brings life to our hearts. And he empowers us by the Spirit to truly and more fully love. In the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at five stories of Jesus. 
and how he lived and how he loved. Each story teaches us a relationship secret that you're not going to want to miss. You're going to want to learn in your own life. Jesus was mindful. Jesus was approachable. Jesus was graceful. Jesus was bold. Jesus was self-giving. Each week, we're going to observe Jesus and learn how we can be more like him with God's help. And my hope is that each one of us will become more mindful, more approachable, more full of grace, more self-giving. Why? Because as we love like that, we will discover that our relationships will be transformed. They'll be transformed. We'll discover that people will begin to see Jesus in us and through us. We'll find that life becomes so much more because we're living it the Jesus way. We're living it the Jesus way. So what do we take away today? Let me just... Wrap it all up with three things. We're taking away the fact that we're taking a journey together. Right? We're journeying together. Engaging both our hearts and our minds to observe and imitate how Jesus loved. That's the first thing. Second, we haven't arrived yet. (laughs) We haven't arrived yet. Um, uh, But all of our desires are to love like him right? Why? Because all of our relationships um, uh, need him, need us to look like him. And then finally, a personal relationship with Jesus is our starting point to love like Jesus. It all starts there. We need him in our hearts. We need his spirit working in us if we're going to love like God.